All right, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to the book of Joshua, A Type and Shadow. And we've been having fun uh, with this um, this uh, study. Uh, good to see Pastor Isaac with us this morning. Um, and so uh, we want to get back into it. Today we're continuing to discover more of how the book of Joshua is filled with types and shadows of things. Other things such as the kingdom of God, the eternal Christ, and the finished work. And we're seeing all these things. So as we look here in the Old Testament, oftentimes what I find is people would not really think that there would be so much um, um, of... Um, the, that the Old Testament would contain so much revelation of of the eternal truth Father God declared um, as the end result about you even from the beginning of time. So as we continue in this verse-by-verse -verse study, it's important to look at all the scripture through the proper interpretive lens, and that proper interpretive lens is always Father's eternal love and unconditional love for his creation. Uh, so my goal is to look and see what Father was trying to reveal to a people of long ago, uh, even as he was interacting with them in their human experience uh, and, and on their journey, uh, how they viewed God's interaction. So a lot of the uh, Old Testament story is really about that. So let's get started as we dig deep into the well of Father's mind within and see more types and shadows and symbolic messages from the book of Joshua. Uh, appreciate everybody joining us this morning uh, as we get going here. Um, got a little bit of a uh, uh, distortion on the screen, but hopefully that'll go away. Uh, we're in lesson number 21, and we're uh, looking at Joshua chapter 15 through 24. Now, the reason I'm taking such a chunk of scripture is because even though we stopped at verse 14 last time, there's a lot of repeats in the first few verses of 15, 16, 17, and so on. And so we want to look at these. Now, uh, in the New King James, these verses uh, read like this. I'll just start with verses 15 through 18, uh, and then we'll go on uh, verses 19 through 24 uh, shortly. Uh, so it says, the Lord, Then the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Command the priests who bear the ark of the testimony. Now notice that the New King James calls this now the ark of the testimony, but all along we've been reading the ark of the covenant. And so the ark of the testimony uh, telling them to come up from the, J the Jordan. So this is still uh, uh, continuing when they're in the uh, the, the middle of the uh, of the um, the River Jordan, uh, good to see Tanya West joining this morning, uh, and they're uh, literally, uh, he's saying, okay, come on out of there, and uh, Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, come up from the Jordan. Verse 18 says, and it came to pass when the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and now we see another scripture. Now he says the Ark of the Covenant. Before he says the Ark of the Testimony. Uh, he says uh, uh, that had come from the midst of the Jordan and the soles of the priest's feet touched the dry land on the other side uh, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. So in other words, uh, the Jordan River returned to its normal flow from uh, where it was before time. I'm gonna make one more adjustment here. I know this doesn't look good for a video, but um, okay. So I think we're good now. All right. Okay, now, um, here's the thing. Um, as our study uh, continues, we saw how that the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord had commanded. Uh, Joshua to speak to his people. 
Now think about this. Then the people hurried and crossed over the Jordan on dry ground. We've been seeing that all along. We saw how that when the people had completely crossed over, the scripture said that when the entire nation was over, that the ark of the Lord and the priest crossed over in the presence of the, the people. And where we left off last time was seeing how that there was about 40,000 prepared for war who had crossed over uh, before the Lord uh, and they were ready for battle. Now, if you didn't see last week's lesson, please go back because I discuss where the desire to kill or to go to war actually comes from and was it ever God's intention for there to be war? And so I addressed that whole scenario in last week's lesson. Uh, I think uh, it really was a powerful uh, lesson to uh, really uh, bring some understanding. Okay, now, uh, this battle was the first in their mission to conquer the land of Canaan, which was to take the city of Jericho. Uh, Joshua 4, verses 15 and 16 in the New English Translation says, The Lord told Joshua, instruct the priests carrying the Ark of the, the, cov uh, the uh, Covenantal Laws, to come up from the Jordan. Now, translators, uh, a translator's note here from the Net Bible says, traditionally, uh, another name for the Ark of the Covenant was the Ark of the Testimony. So we just saw that. So the Hebrew term for covenant also means testimony or witness, as uh, here in this passage that refers to the Mosaic Covenant and the body of requirements contained within it. Yet on that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel and they respected him. We talked about why why they used the word that they feared him, which was really, to me, a poor translation to fear God, to fear others. Uh, but respect is a better word. Uh, it's a more fitting word. It's a more, uh, it really does bring a proper interpretive um, um, uh, 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 awakening to this this portion of scripture or other portions of scriptures. So they respected him as their leader and the scripture said they did that all the days of their life. Now then the Lord spoke to Joshua saying command the priests who bear the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests accordingly and it came to pass when the priests uh, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord came from the midst of the Jordan and the soles of their feet uh, touched the dry ground on the other side of the Jordan and the waters returned to their normal flow. Uh, and and what was their normal flow before? Their normal flow was uh, that it was out overflowing the bank because it was the season for the snows melting in the mountains and coming down and flooding. And we talked about how that this, this can also be uh, symbolic of, of Holy Spirit in their midst. Now, since this journey of conquering the land of Canaan is an allegory for conquering the wandering thoughts within the unrenewed soul of mankind, it's important to see how that the crossing over the Jordan symbolizes how we also must cross some old religious thinking that deeply flows through the recesses of our minds and seems to come up uh, 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 again and again because we have not yet uh, truly conquered them. So if you think about old religious ideology that flows through your mind, it flows through your thoughts, uh, think about that, how that uh, it becomes an overflowing river uh, that uh, is seemingly at times hard to overcome. And so that being said, uh, it's really important to understand how that uh, it, we need to conquer those thoughts within ourselves, right? Amen. And so knowing that, literally, uh, we need to see that um, even though there are thoughts of religious ideology that are unrenewed, okay? Um, uh, still, um, you know, uh, they are conquerable, okay? They are doable. Uh, so this is an allegory. This is a metaphor. This is a type uh, and, and shadow uh, scenario. And, and so what we see here is that uh, as, the, as the children of Israel have crossed, uh, this shows us how that we too are able to cross over the religion 
of uh, of 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 uh, false thoughts of false concepts. Now uh, Joshua 4 17 and 18 in the Net Bible says so Joshua instructed the priests come up from the Jordan and the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan and as soon as they set foot on dry ground the waters of the Jordan flowed again and returned to to the flood stage. So what patience are exhibited here by these priests? Uh, if you could imagine all of these people, the people of Israel, and, and the number was astronomical, uh, these priests exhibit such patience because as they stand in the middle of the Jordan, uh, the waters actually uh, go back because, or, or hold back. They stand up before them uh, because of the presence of the Lord and uh, who stood with the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders the entire time that it took the nation of Israel to cross over. Now, the visible token of the presence of God had to remain in the river through the entire crossing. God had fulfilled his promise to Joshua as he raised him up as a great leader for Israel, even as he had done with Moses. Now, the fact is that no matter who you are, Father has a plan for your life. Are you hearing that? Uh, no matter who you are, no matter what's going on in your life, Father God has a plan for you. Uh, it, it's, it's, and, and believe it or not, uh, you may not be another Oral Roberts who stands on uh, in tent meetings of, of, of thousands and thousands. You may not be another Billy Graham or a Reinhardt Bonnke. Uh, just be who you are. Don't try to emulate or, or to copy other ministers, to be like other ministers. Be who God created you to be. Find that out. Okay, and and then after you find that out, uh, get in the flow of Father's plan for your life uh, that is far greater than you can even imagine, right? Well, just remember that even when you face challenges or obstacles in life that seem to be a um, um, a momentary distraction for you, Father had already uh, in it, uh, it had uh, in his original. Uh, 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 creation, uh, a plan for things to return back to the, a normal supernatural flow, just like the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed uh, before them in their banks. Now listen, here's something very important. When there's obstacles, when there's uh, uh, when there's lack, when there's uh, the presence of, of affliction, it's very important for you to understand. Uh, be patient. Stay in the in in a mode of worship and and the, and the, the word and and uh, and in communication with Father because it's going to break and you're going to come back to the normal flow of the supernatural just like you were before. Did it ever change? No. But what it was is obstacles are distractions. Now, some people don't believe in God's timing. And I wanted to say this today. Uh, the fact is that, uh, that the, uh, 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 the manner of life or the timing with the Jordan River to return to its natural flow, uh, and this shows us, um, shows, uh, uh, shows this event as supernaturally arranged by God. Okay, everything that was done, uh, Jordan, uh, the children of Israel crossing the Jordan, the priest standing in the middle of the Jordan, the water standing back waiting for them to cross over. When the last one's crossed over, the priests go, and as soon as their foot hit, feet hit on dry ground, and I would assume that's the last one in the train of carrying the ark, uh, that it instantly the waters return to their normal flow in the Jordan and uh, float outside of the banks. So it's always going to be come back to normal, uh, even if it appears to be out of a normal um, uh, order. Okay, Joshua 4, verse 19 to 24 says, Now the people came up from the, the uh, Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they camped in Gal uh, Gilgal. Uh, on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones uh, which they took out of the Jordan, uh, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Now remember, we talked about this a few lessons ago. 
uh, that the, re the purpose of s establishing memorial stones uh, is so that, or establishing memories, you might do that in a picture book, a photo album. Uh, you might do that by documenting some things and, and, uh, and publicizing them so that your children will look back and say, what was the purpose of this? And they begin to read or to watch and they hear the purpose. So it's very important. Yes, we memorialize things differently than they did in the Old Testament, but still we memorialize or make memories even today. Uh, he says then in verse 22, uh, Then uh, you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land, for the Lord your God dried up the waters before uh, the waters of the Jordan before you until the, they, you had crossed over, uh, and the Lord your God did, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea. So you remember just stepping back in time just a moment, Moses and the children of Israel are at the Red Sea, the waters part. They stand up on either side, right? Okay, and in that, uh, the children of Israel cross over on what? On dry ground. All right, well, here at the, in the book of Joshua, uh, the Jordan River stands up on one side, and the children of Israel cross over on dry ground. Uh, so God had dried up uh, the Red Sea before the, the children of Israel, before they had crossed over. And that's another uh, memorial or another um, uh, memory uh, that uh, is for the children uh, of future generations. Now, uh, he did that so that all peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you may fear or respect the Lord your God forever. Now, Joshua 4, verse 24 in the Message Bible, just real briefly, and I'll look at it again later, says, so that you would hold God in solemn reverence always. So that was really the point. So again, to fear the Lord is to respect or uh, reverence him, uh, but never to be afraid of God. So we really have a poor understanding of the word fear. Uh, I am fearful or to be afraid. How about just to respect God? Because, you know, we had the King James and the New King James and other translations that really do put a false... Um, uh, perspective on the scriptures. Okay, now notice what Joshua 4.19 says in the New English translation. The people went up before the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and camped in Gilgal on the eastern borders of Jericho. A study note uh, from the New English translation says the first month was the month of Ab Abib. Uh, which was late March, early April in the modern calendar. Uh, the preparations for Passover also begin on the 10th day of the first month, according to Exodus 12, verse 2 and 3. We're not going to turn back there and read it, but it's just there as a reference if you care to write it down and look at it later. Now, according to our calendar, this season is defined as springtime, uh, when everything becomes fresh again. Now, I want you to notice this. Everyone has uh, has gone through what appears to be a dry, cold, or non-productive time or season in your life, uh, and and you need uh, you need a season of freshness when things are like that, or a season of refreshing when all things become new and fresh again. A spiritual typology here would be like when Peter was preaching on the day of, uh, after the day of Pentecost in Acts three nineteen, and he says, "Repent, therefore." and be converted uh, that your sins may be blotted out at, so that the times of refresh, refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now, they had followed after the priests in the book of Joshua who symbolically carried the presence of the Lord with them and after a weary journey from Egypt to the border of Canaan, they were ready to rest for the rest of the Lord, the R-E-S-T, uh, within uh, this, this overwhelming presence of, I'm just at peace. Why? So that the refreshing would manifest. See, the thing that Peter's talking about here in this verse, he says, repent in Acts 3. Repent, which is the word, that, uh, the Greek word that comes from, uh, we see the Greek word meten, metanaeo. And it's defined as to think differently afterwards or to reconsider it. And now, literally, it means to change one's mind. If the journey you have been on seems to have been rough, okay? I don't know where you're at in life right now. 
But if what you're facing, what you're dealing with seems to be rough, do not uh, uh, come out of it bitter and disgusted. That's not the plan of God. Take a moment, look back, and see what you learned from the experience. Then repent or change the way you think about life, right? Well, Joshua 4 verse 20 in the New English Translation says, Now Joshua set up in Gilgal the twelve stones that they had taken from the Jordan. So this specifically is referring to the twelve stones mentioned in verses 3 through 7 that they brought across the river with them to the place they would camp. Now, the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month. Uh, that doesn't mean January the twi- uh, the tenth. Uh, their um, uh, their um, uh, calendar, the, the the Hebrew calendar, uh, is is really different than our calendars, uh, than the the modern calendar. But that's okay. Uh, they they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. Now. Those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, uh, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Why? Well, the first thing they did in Gilgal was to set up a memorial, uh, set up memorial stones or uh, to mark or remember the victories they had just experienced. I think it's good in the journey to pause every now and then and just just memorialize the things that God has done, that God has brought you through. See, they camped in Gilgal, which would become their base of operations for the conquest of the entire promised land. And, you know, I mean, you're talking about a, 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 a couple of million people moving them from place to place. So literally, they had a base of operation. Now, that's really important to remember uh, as we go along in this study. See, this is why it is a, a, was appropriate that the first work at Gilgal was to set up memorial stones uh, or memory stones rather to memorialize the great work that God had done for them. Now I want you to notice this in Joshua 4 verse 21 uh, and 23 uh, in the Net Bible. He told the Israelites, when your children someday ask their fathers, what do these stones represent? Explain. Or, in other words, make known to your children, Israel crossed over the Jordan River on dry ground. What are they going to connect that with? They're literally going to connect that with back to when Moses and the at the Red Sea and the children of Israel crossed over on dry ground. So I think it's it all ties together, you see. All right, he says in verse 23, For the Lord your God dried up the water of the Jordan before uh, you uh, before you while you crossed over. It was like the Lord, uh, your God, dried up the Red Sea before us while we crossed it. So <clears throat> this is very very important. All right, now uh, here again from a translator's note uh, in the New English Translation Bible, it says that the Hebrew would read just as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us while we crossed uh, crossed over. So this was just one more reminder locked away in the memory of the children of Israel pertaining to the goodness of God. Look what Romans 4 verse uh, Romans 2 verse 4 says in the Passion Translation, it says, do the riches of of his extraordinary extraordinary kindness make you take him for granted and despise him? In other words, uh, are you just going to treat the the blessings, the the benefits, the the works of God as if they're non-existent by not remembering them? And so this is one of the reasons why they, they memorialized each event. Okay, now here's the thing. Um, he says, haven't you experienced and uh, how kind and interesting, uh, how kind and understanding uh, he has been to you, God has been to you? Don't mistake his tolerance for acceptance. Do you realize that the, uh, all the wealth of his extravagant kindness, the Aramaic says his sweetness, is meant to melt your heart and lead you into repentance. This is the scripture that you will better know uh, as um, 
uh, uh, that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Now, the last part uh, of this verse from the Aramaic can be translated, do you not know that it is the fulfillment of God to bring you blessing? So, uh, you know, listen, uh, again, uh, I would say that uh, there are a lot of believers who face difficulties around the world uh, in their lives who become blinded by what they are facing and they forget that uh, that they uh, they that we we learn to endure in both the perceivable good times and bad times in life uh, that the only thing that can come next is the fulfillment of God's continued plan of blessing for you just remember that what you're walking through right now is a distraction now, the reason why it appears that it's a time of no blessing, it's a time of no presence, is because it's a distraction. That's what it's designed to do. And so we go through these things in life, these distractions, but just remember, it's all going to come back to normal. Uh, blessing is about to manifest because that's the will and the plan of God. It's not that God deliberately brings hard times to you, but it's just that when it rains on the just and the unjust in life, it's a matter of no Knowing that the outcome of Father's heart um, is good, no matter what you face. Amen. So it's very important to understand that, that just because you're facing something right now, uh, it's important not to focus on that distraction. Okay, don't let that become your focus, uh, but literally uh, let God be your focus. Now, Joshua 4.24 uh, in the Net Bible says he has done this in order or that, uh, so all the nations or peoples of the earth might recognize the Lord's power, and so you might always obey the Lord your God. Now, let me just say this. When we're talking about uh, uh, the, the journey of mankind, so this is my uh, theological uh, position, is that Genesis chapter 2 all the way to the end of Revelation chapter 20 is a picture or a story of man's human experience, man's journey. When we see what man says about how what God had to say, this is man's version of how God interacted with them, and it's the story of how they interacted with life and with what they understood about God. So while in the Old Testament we are looking at man's view of how they see God and, uh, and, and their version of how they attempted to interact with God, the fact is that Father's desire was always to show or or demonstrate his love and kindness to his creation. Always, okay? Now, one more time from a translator's note in the Net Bible, it says that the Hebrew could read, Know the hand of the Lord, that it is strong. So God always wants you to know that he never leaves you, he never forsakes you. Why? Because in Genesis chapter 1, you were created as one with God. God was before you, the creator created you, and uh, you came forth as one with your Father. And even when you look at Revelation chapter 21 and 22, you see that we're still one. The, the temple is a picture, of one temple is a picture of, of being one with God. So in other words, sometimes when people walk through hard times, they come out on the other side and only focus on and remember the hard times instead of how they got through the hard times, right? Think about that. We hear about the hard times. We think about the hard times. Man, yesterday was bad. Last month was horrible. I've had a terrible year. I've heard those stories before. But let me just ask you this. How did you get through those hard times? If that was a terrible year, the worst year you've ever had, how'd you get through it? How are you making it today? How are you being successful today? It's because God walked with you. I'm not talking about footprints in the sand type scenario. I'm talking about that you were one with God the entire time. Look, sometimes people are so ungrateful that they had to walk through uh, any type of difficulty that they completely overlooked. It was uh, God that got them them through the challenge they were facing in the first place. I mean, think about how that you are now finished with that particular obstacle at that point in time, this would not be an occasion to be, uh, 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 let me back up here, would this not be an occasion to be thankful or to even express thanksgiving to your creator who brought you through it? 
Think about that. First Thessalonians says in, in First Thessalonians 5 verse 18, uh, it says, and in the midst of everything. Now, I know this scripture wasn't written uh, in the Old Testament necessarily, but these are Old Testament people in the New Testament. Remember, there is no New Testament Bible. There is no New Testament until around 300 A.D., uh, 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 yeah, 300 A.D., um, <clears throat> and, and so... They're writing about their experiences and out of the revelation of Christ. They're writing from the revelation of Christ. But think about this again. And in the midst of everything, be always giving thanks for this is God's perfect plan for you in Christ Jesus. So in other words, God never said that his will was for you to give thanks in all things. See, that's what we do. God says in all things give thanks. We don't give thanks for all things. We give thanks in, uh, in all things. Uh, simply in everything in life, we give thanks for this is the will of God or the perfect plan of God. So again, we're not giving thanks for all things. Some people think, well, Lord, I thank you that I'm going through this hard time. No, I, I'm not thankful for the hard times. But here's what I do say. I do say I'm thankful for the journey and the things I've learned in the journey, the good things. You know, I can't, I, I've been in ministry 49 years and uh, currently my my earth date is uh, is at uh, 66 years old and i have, have, have as i've transitioned from re religious ideology uh, a, a, at least to the place that i am today I, there was a time i looked back and i was very ungrateful for the journey i tr i tried to throw memories away and throw things away that throw as they say throw the baby out with the bathwater uh, i literally was unthankful but in time i learned to be thankful for the journey because now I could look back and say, you know what? That was just one stepping stone to the next place I was moving in God. And God was with me the whole time. See, do you know that stress and worry and anger can shorten your life? I mean, listen, uh, while I don't believe in death, I believe that those who are visible, that you can see, for example, seeing me in the camera right now, uh, to, to not be able to see me, and for there to be an obituary written about me would mean that I didn't leave you. I just returned to invisibility. Why? Because that was the starting place. That's where I came from. That's why Jesus, who came from invisibility to visibility, simply when the disciples couldn't see him anymore on the, on the, in Acts 1-9, he simply returned to invisibility. But he didn't go anywhere. He, If you take an object that is visible, all of a sudden it becomes invisible. Okay, uh, sometimes we think, well, that which was visible went to, in, to become invisible and that's it. No, that which was invisible became visible. And for it to become invisible again returns to invisibility. And there's another lesson there. But did you know that these very same things can cause aging and health issues? So stress and anger and, 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 um, uh, uh, anxiety uh, can really hurt your physical body and your mind, right? So uh, it's important that we learn, even though maybe many of us later in life, that we learn how to not be stressed, how to not be angry, and how to handle things because Father is with us every moment that there's a problem or a pressure, and we need to realize that he has a better plan for you, which is to have a thankful mind or a heart attitude filled with grateful thoughts that produce thanksgiving. Amen? And, and I think it's very important that we really do learn to have a thankful heart. It seems that Joshua 4, verses 16 through 18, could identify three areas uh, our lives must focus on, which are, one, unbound joy, two, praying continually, and three, giving thanks to God no matter what happens in our lives. Um, and so think about these things. Uh, th these three virtues, we'll call them virtues, combined together form the wonderful expression of Christ's life from within us. To tell someone that the eternal Christ is alive within you is not enough. Listen to me. To tell someone, I'm a Christian, Christ is alive in me, is not enough. Um, uh, to tell people about the love and the grace of God is not enough. 
the best way to testify of the goodness of our God, of the grace and the love of our God, is to demonstrate who he is by putting his nature and character on display in your life. When you purposely practice being thankful in all things, then Joshua 4.24 comes to life from within you, uh, that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that he may, uh, that you may fear the Lord or respect the Lord your God forever. Now, as the Message Bible has said, so that you would hold God in solemn reverence, meaning uh, that God's demonstration of his goodness uh, builds trust and respect within you uh, for your Father. So the fact is, is that those these are things we learn in life, okay? Now, remember, not only does Father God, uh, Father Knows Best, remember that old TV show, Father Knows Best, amen? Um, uh, well... It's true, okay? Father really does know best. Uh, not the father on television, but Father God. Uh, but Father uh, is always true to his word, amen? There, there was obviously a purpose in the memorial stones for the ch people of Israel themselves, which was likened unto mankind today, and, and, and st establishing memories, remembering the goodness of the Lord. Well, it seems so easy for us to forget that great miracles God worked for us, which were to serve as a reminder of how good God is. I mean, I can remember back now. I was I don't re exactly remember, but I've heard the story so many times that I can almost see it in my mind's eye uh, that I was born with a crippled neck, my head laying over to the side, and uh, and I was prayed for and healed. I remember uh, at nine years old walking down the aisle in the church where my dad was pastor, and I was walking with a limp because I'd had rheumatic fever and and it crippled my body and. Uh, uh, and walking back to my chair without a limp. I remember those times. I remember the goodness of God and many other things. See, sometimes people do not remember the past uh, great works of God, which all always, which allows them to live in a dreamland of the past, thinking that the best days of our Christian experience are behind us. Listen, uh, those are good times. Remember those moments as a point of faith. So we continue to trust our Father no matter what, because who He is and who Father has created you as remains the same in the past, the present, and the future. Why is that? Because we have seen and experienced His past faithfulness to set up memorial stones or points of remembrance is so we that we have a point of contact with God's work in the past and remember that God's work did not begin then uh, but have been working within you from eternity past and guess what they continue to work in you amen all right now these works of the father become an arc of testimony listen to this I'm about to close and I have some really important to say today uh, these works of, the, of God that we remember, they become an arc of testimony as we read in the scriptures or a point of reminder about the covenant you have with God that was established in, uh, in the beginning as eternal truth. We see that in Genesis chapter 1. And by this testimony, all of the people of the earth you come in contact with will hear about the goodness of God. They'll hear this testimony and not about the focus on bad things producing a testimony of disgruntlement. Uh, there is an eternal purpose in your testimony. Listen, there is an eternal purpose in your testimony, which is so that you will know that your father is a loving God who cares about you so much that he even made provision for you in eternity past for the times you would face difficulties in life. No, you don't need a test to have a testimony. Uh, this is false uh, propaganda, okay? This is false doctrine. You don't need a test to have a testimony. Some people say, God gave you a test so you can have a testimony. First of all, God did not give you a test. 
All right? God's not trying to test you. God's trying to reveal something to you. He's trying to reveal who you are. David said in Psalm 118, verse 29, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. That's what he said in the Old Testament. And then Paul said in Colossians 3, verse 15, Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart and mind. Keep you in tune, he says, with each other, in step with each other. None of this is going, uh, none of this, he says, is going off and doing your own thing and collective uh, and collect and cultivate thankfulness. Did you hear that? Cultivate thankfulness. Work a practice being thankful instead of unthankful in life. Paul also said in Philippians 4.16, the Passion Translation, don't be pulled in different directions uh, or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. How do I pray? He just told you. Father, I thank you that all things are mine. Father, I thank you that all my need is supplied. Father, I thank you that I have all things. Father, I thank you that you love me unconditional. Prayers of gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life, Paul says. So these are very important points that we need to remember and we need to practice in our own individual lives. And the same thing was true with the children of Israel. Uh, they had these great testimonies from all the way from Egypt to now uh, camping at Gilgal across the Jordan and thinking about all these wonderful things God had done and setting up uh, memory stones or memorializing uh, the things that God had done, just as we should should do. Amen? Well, I hope you got something out of this lesson today, and join me next time for more on the book of Joshua, A Type and Shadow, uh, as this verse-by-verse -verse study unfolds. Amen? Have a great day. Listen, join me tomorrow night. Pastor Christopher Anderson will be on with me, and then Friday morning, Pastor Terry uh, Bench will be with me. Uh, so, great shows coming up. We'll see you next time. Everybody have a wonderful day. I'll see you then. Bye-bye, everyone.